10 Minute Jazz Lesson Podcast, episode 317. Hey everybody, welcome back to episode 317 of the 10 Minute Jazz Lesson Podcast. It is the end of the month, so you know what that means. We're doing our Tune of the Month episode, and this month we're going to cover one of my personal favorite jazz standards, but a tough one. We are going to talk about Stella by Starlight this particular episode. So before we get into the meat of the episode, a quick word on how this podcast stays in business. We do not have any advertisements on the show, which means that we rely on support from listeners just like you in the form of a small monthly donation. And for that donation, you do get a PDF that goes along with every single episode, along with audio examples and lots of good stuff. We use the Patreon platform, so if you want to learn more about supporting the show, Head over to our website, 10minutejazzlesson.com, click on one of the Patreon banners, and you can go over there and see all the benefits you will get for a small monthly donation every month. Quick shout out to some new patrons this week. Thank you to our new $5 patrons, Dwight and Ryan, and thank you to our new $3 patron, Daoud. Thank you guys so much for joining up with the 10 Minute Jazz Lesson family, and of course to everybody over there that's been supporting us for months and years. Thank you. We could not do this show without you. So again, 10minutejazzlesson.com. Click on one of the Patreon banners. Get yourself signed up today for instant access to all those materials, including this week's. All right, so as I mentioned, we are going to be talking about the great Victor Young Jazz Standard Stella by Starlight this week. We are going to start by talking about the form because it is a doozy with really, really difficult chord changes. And this is one of the few tunes that I would consider to be A, B, C, D. So let's start by talking about the form. So it's 32 bars. But the problem with this form, which makes it a little bit harder to memorize, is that none of the sections ever repeat themselves. So as I mentioned, I would break this up into eight bar sections, and I would consider it to be A, B, C, D, which is not a form that we see a lot in terms of jazz standards. Usually there's at least one section that kind of repeats itself but not with this tune. Now, diving into the chord changes a little bit more deeply, one of the reasons that I chose this tune, besides the fact that I love it and I think everybody should know this tune, is that there are tons of deceptive cadences. And that is something that we have talked about this month at length. So this is a perfect example of some cadences that are deceptive, used in a real life situation, and we should explore them a little bit more deeply. So let's start with the A section. So starting right off, we see a deceptive cadence right off the bat. In concert pitch, this looks like it's gonna be a two five in F sharp minor. So we start with a G sharp minor seven flat five, and then we go to a C sharp seven flat nine, and then we want it to go to F sharp minor, but it doesn't. It goes to instead a 2-5 in the key of D. E minor 7 to A7. And then, oh, look at that, another deceptive cadence. Instead of going to D, instead we kick off a 2-5 in the key of G. A minor 7 to D7. Now we finally resolve there to the key of G major. Then we go up to the 4 in G major to C7, and then we're into the B section. So you can see there's actually two deceptive cadences in the first eight bars of this tune, and that's one of the reasons that I chose it. So let's dive into the B section. So this is starting in measure 9. We start with a D major chord. Then we get an actual authentic cadence. We get that G sharp minor 7 flat 5 to C sharp 7, and then we do actually go to F sharp minor. Okay, that's where we think it's going to go. Then we have a 2 5 in what seems to be the key of C, D minor 7 to G7, but then guess what? Another deceptive cadence. Instead of going to C, we go up to A major. And remember, this is called a backdoor progression. And if you're not sure what that is, we did an entire series of episodes on it. So go to the website and search for 
backdoor cadence or backdoor progression, and those episodes will pop up. Okay, so after we get to that A major seven, then we see another two five in what looks like F sharp minor again. We've seen this a lot, and then again, it doesn't go there. Instead, what we do is we start a 2-5 to the key of B. So C sharp minor 7 flat 5 to F sharp 7. And then the first chord of, I guess you wouldn't call it the bridge, you would call it the C section, is a B chord. So that is an authentic cadence. But it's not a regular old B major chord, it's a B7 sharp 5. And that brings us into the C section. Now the chords spread out a little bit more. They get a little bit easier to remember. So we start with that B7 sharp five, and then we go to E minor seven, which is a five to one movement. Then we get a C7 sharp 11, and then we go to D major. So that's kind of a backdoor progression in itself. Now we get to the D section, the last eight bars, and these actually make a ton of sense. If you look at measure 25 through the end of the tune, the cool part is it's just going around the circle of fourths, right? So we get G sharp minor seven flat five to C seven, and then we get F sharp minor seven flat five to B seven, and then we get E minor seven flat five to A seven. And then finally we drop into D major. Okay, so what that is, is just a circle of fourths, two, five, two, five, two, five. And then we finally get to one. So as you can see, I think the A section and the B section are the hardest parts of the tune to make sense of and to remember because seemingly it's just going everywhere it doesn't make any sense but the more that you play this the more you will start to hear where those chord progressions are going and once you get used to it it is truly one of the most beautiful chord progressions in my opinion so don't let the fact that it's so complicated stop you from learning this tune it's just a gorgeous melody and a gorgeous set of chord changes but with the caveat it's gonna be a little bit harder than a lot of the other tunes out there. All right, now let's start talking about the etude that I wrote over this. So I wrote two choruses of an etude over it. And one of the things that I think about when I play this tune is that my usual sort of bebop, aggressive, fill all the measures with notes uh, style of playing that I will use on a lot of other tunes doesn't necessarily seem to work that well over this tune. I find myself playing a lot more sparsely, using a lot more silence in my playing over this tune because the changes don't make as much sense. So I can't just rely on my muscle memory and the lines that I have under my fingers and in my ears. I have to think a little bit harder, but ultimately I think that makes for a prettier style of playing where I can't just do my thing. You know, if I'm playing over a Cherokee or rhythm changes or even the blues, a lot of the time, and I'm not saying this is a good thing, I'll just kind of go off of muscle memory, right? I just know so much vocabulary and I've played over those chord progressions so much that I can play without thinking very hard. And that's a bad thing a lot of the time, but a lot of time it works. It works really well. Over this tune, I find that no matter how many times I've played it, it's probably you know, upward of 500 times that I've played this tune. Um, it just doesn't work like that when I'm playing over this tune. And I love that because it really gets me out of my comfortable space and forces me to think a little bit harder and really play as melodically as I can, be mindful of what's going on and use some space. So I want you to think about that when you listen to this etude. The other thing I want you to try to find is I did steal that Phil Woods line that we talked about last week and I did put it in here. So I want to challenge you to find where I use that Phil Woods line and see if you can make sense of it. All right, so let's check out the etude. Thank you. 
just love those chord changes, really, really do. And this is also one of my favorite melodies out of any jazz standard. Just beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So I took a lot of inspiration from kind of the way that I would normally play over that. Um, upon listening to it again after talking to you, there's not that much space. But I do think that my approach is very, very different than what I would play over a Charlie Parker tune or something with changes that uh, follow a more traditional path. I think that melodically this solo um, is very different from a lot of the other etudes that I've written and a lot of the way that I play normally. So let me know if you have any questions about that, but do learn this tune. If this is not part of your arsenal, make it a goal to learn this tune, even though it might be a pretty big challenge, it will pay off. And this is a tune that gets played all the time. I played it a couple times this week at jam sessions and things like that. So it would be good to know this particular composition. So let me know if you have any questions, you can get in touch with me on the 10 Minute Jazz Lesson Facebook group, or you can always email me at 10minutejazzlesson at gmail.com. Remember to go over to the website, check out those benefits you get on Patreon and get signed up, 10minutejazzlesson.com. Click on one of the Patreon banners and get yourself signed up today. This etude will be up if you sign up. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Have a great weekend. As always, I hope you're staying safe and healthy out there and we'll talk to you soon. Bye everybody. Mm -hmm.